Amen. All right, how many of you brought your cell phones to church? I'm about to preach. How many of you brought your cell phones to church? Don't lie to me. Lift, lift your hand. Amen. All right, so you're expecting me to tell you to cut them off. That's not going to happen. I want you to cut them on, cut your cell phone on right now. Even if you got a brick phone, 35 or over, baby. Can you to hold like this? If you got a, how many of y'all remember bag phones? You had to walk around in a suitcase to talk on a phone. How many of y'all remember phone booths? Touch somebody's got their hand up and say, You old as heck. You old as heck. <laughs> Your kid's like a phone booth. What's that? <laughs> Y'all remember we used to talk on the phone to your boyfriend, to your girlfriend, and, 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 and it was on the cord, and you'd be all in the kitchen sitting up against the refrigerator talking about, yeah, for real? <laughs> oh, something wrong with y'all. That's why I ain't going to join this church, because something wrong with you. So get those phones. I want you to do me a favor. Grab your phones really quickly. And are they on or are your phones on? Okay. I, I want you right now to call somebody, call somebody, and invite them to be at Easter Resurrection Service. Call them right now. Call them right now. If they pick up, that means they ain't in church. Those are the people we want here, right? We're believing God for 3,000 people in the building and 300 souls at the altar. How many of y'all will come into agreement with me? All right, 3,000 in the building and 300 at the altar. We've seen that happen before. It's happened a couple of years uh, straight. And so we're going to have one service. We're going to jam pack as many chairs in here. We can hold 1,700. I think there's 1,300 chairs down now. But we can hold about 1,700 in here. But we're going to go straight hood. And we're going to put 2,000 in here. And then we're going to put 1,000 out there. So get that, get, that, get that person on the phone. Don't hang up with them. Y'all, everybody should be calling. Tell them, yeah, I'm at church. My pastor got me calling you at church. Don't hang up with them. I want to pray for them. I want to pray for them before, uh, before you hang up, all right? So everybody should be calling somebody. If you got somebody on the phone, wave at me, okay? If you don't, call somebody else, amen. If you only have two contacts in your phone, I'll be your friend for $50 an hour, amen. All right, tell them your pastor needs to talk to him for a moment. All right, lift that phone in the air. Lift that phone in the air. I want to talk to you. Listen, family, um, I know you're not in church right now, but we are, and I know it's unique and strange that somebody is calling you from church. I know of, uh, that's not traditional church, but we're not a traditional church. And so I personally want to invite you all to be with me on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. God has a miracle for you. And so we would love for you to be our guest. We're going to start at 1230. And we won't be here a long time, but it's going to be enough to turn your situation around. So be, be conscious and cognitive to be able to be here with us. Lift that phone up. I just want to pray for you really quickly. My brothers and sisters, those of you that are listening to me, here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God loves you so much that it does not matter what you've done wrong in your past. I don't care what you've done wrong. He loves you so much. That no matter what you've done wrong last month or last year or last week or last night, God will save you if you want to be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done or what somebody's done for you. And many of you, if the truth be told, you've been hurt by church. That's why you're not in it right now. But God told me to tell you that you do not have to be in church, in somebody's sanctuary to get saved. He'll save you right now. You don't have to wait till Easter Sunday. He will save you right now. So if you don't know what's going to happen to you after you die, perhaps you have a brain aneurysm or you're, you're killed in a drive-by shooting like what just happened last week here in Knoxville. If, if, if you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? Would you go to heaven? Well, let me tell you something. You only have to do one thing to go to heaven. It is to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. 
And so if you want to go to heaven and you're not exactly sure if you're going, I just want you to pray this prayer with me right here, wherever you are in the living room, in the kitchen, in the car. You could be in an ICU room. I don't know where you are, but wherever you are, if you pray this prayer and you believe it by faith in your heart, God's going to save you right where you are. You are. So if you want to go to heaven, you don't want to go to hell, you want to live for Jesus, you don't want to live for yourself. Today is the day of salvation. Now God's going to save you as we're praying. If that's you, I want you to pray with me. I want everybody in this building to pray with me also. Say, Jesus Christ, I believe by faith that you died for me, that you took away all of my sin. And early the third day morning, you got up from the grave to save me. I believe by faith that because you've died for me, when I die, I don't have to go to hell. I can go to heaven. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I can live for you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I'm saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to get on that phone and ask them, did you pray that prayer? And if they say yes, say yes, I want you to lift your hand. I want you to lift their hand. Cut those lights on all over the building. Cut those lights on all over the building. If they said yes, I want you to lift your hand. One soul into the kingdom, two souls into the kingdom, three souls into the kingdom, four souls into the kingdom, five souls into the kingdom, six souls into the kingdom, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 34 souls just got saved and on the telephone. Welcome to the kingdom of God. The Bible says that when one repents, the angels throw a Holy Ghost party in heaven. Well, if the angels will throw a Holy Ghost party in heaven, you ought to throw one on earth. Somebody give God praise today. Hallelujah. Everyone stand with me. What an amazing day. So I need all of you inviting those that uh, you believe need to need to know Jesus to come into the kingdom of God. And I want you to invite your saved people, your unsaved people, people that have been burnt out at church, people have been hurt by pastors, people have been hurt by deacons, people that have hurt people. Bring them to church. We're going to have an amazing, an amazing, an amazing Resurrection Sunday. I think I'm going to give away a flat screen TV, 55 inch. Who won it? All right. All right, the person that brings the most, you got to bring over 10 people. I'm going to give you a flat screen TV. Amen? All right, so I want you to invite people, people that you know and people that you don't know. The ushers will make sure that these cards are in your hand. Y'all take me to 30 minutes. We're gonna, we got to get out of here. The ushers will put these cards in your hand. If you don't have one, get three or four of them and hand them out to people at the gas station at McDonald's. Buy somebody a cup of coffee and hand this to them and say, hey, meet me at OBC. Buy somebody, you know, a, a, a sweet potato pie or something. Give it to them and say, hey, meet me at OBC. Put some gas in somebody's car. Say, meet me at OBC. When you go to your restaurant of your choice today after church, I want you as a tip, leave a decent tip and leave this on the table for your waitress. Say amen to that. Turn your Bibles to Luke 19. Luke 19. I've got to do this quickly. Luke 19, and then we'll get you out of here. I don't want to hold you today. Luke 19, everyone standing, even the babies, if you see children that are sitting, uh, have them stand and teach them, hey, this is how we reverence the word of God. Luke 19. Luke 19, for those of you uh, that, that uh, the Lord is still healing your legs, that's fine. You, 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 you be seated. But for those of us who have good legs, amen, stand, stand to, you, to your feet, all right? Luke 19, I'm still in a series called Miracles at the Feet of the Master. Hadn't it been good, y'all? That series has been good. Next week, week after next, we start a series called Total Transformation. You're going to walk in this building and say, something is wrong with my pastor. When you see the staging, you're going to say, something wrong with that dude. Uh, we're going to do something on this stage that has never been done before, probably ever. But uh, pray for me, something wrong with me. All right? So I need, did the mother say, I I'm praying for you? All right. All right. 
Luke 19, Luke 19 out of the NIV. I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, don't start my time until I read my scripture. Jesus entered in Jericho and was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Everybody say Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He was very rich. Bump somebody and ask him, do you want to be rich? Now, if they don't answer, scoot over because that's the broke roll. Amen. Tell them I don't sit next to broke people. No, mm -mm. I don't even sit next to broke people. I'm allergic to broke people. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Come on. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And he came down and at once he welcomed him gladly. Listen to the next couple of verses and I'll get into the teaching. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to the to, to, to be a guest at a sinner's house? Jesus going to sinner's cribs? It must have been some old church people, wasn't it? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will repay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today, everybody say today. Today, 37 souls came into the kingdom over the phone. That ain't what it say. I'm sorry. Today, salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. Today, for just a few moments, I want to talk to you and literally talk to you today. From the subject of the danger of living an upside down life. The danger of living an upside down life. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Order is God's strategy for increase. Order. Order is God's strategy for increase. Order. This, is, this, this, is, this statement is going to be disappointing for many of you. And I'm not saying it to frustrate you, and I'm not saying it to upset you, but I'm saying it to bring some sense of theological understanding and relevance and intellectual cognitive understanding of how the Scriptures work. The promises of God are yea and amen, but if you don't have your life in order... You will shout over promises and high-five your neighbor over promises, and you will sing about promises, but you will never have them manifested in your life. Because God's strategy for increase is order. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, the first chapter, that as God is creating the heavens and the earth and he's putting everything in place, the Bible says that God puts seed in the ground. And the purpose of that seed that he put in the ground is that the seed would produce a harvest in the life of the garden so that Adam might be able to receive. But before God created the heavens and the earth with Adam in it, he made sure that he put seed in the ground. But the problem is that there was no harvest. He sent not rain unto the earth because there was no man to till it. The word till there means to manage it. Listen to what I'm saying. The Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. He makes everything good and he puts seed in the ground. But the Bible says that there was no harvest from that seed because there was no man there to manage it. The reason God would not send rain down. You know anything about agricultural uh, culture. If rain comes, something's going to grow. That's why you're now looking for a person to cut your grass or you're beginning to cut your grass because it's been raining a lot. And as it begins to rain, you didn't have to plant anything. The seeds were already in the ground and ground and grass and weeds and all types of things are beginning to grow. Flowers are coming up. It is because it's been raining. All you need is seed in the ground and rain that comes down from heaven and automatically harvest takes place. 
But God refused to allow it to rain, although there was seed in the ground, because there was no man to manage it. Let me tell you something. God will stop the harvest in your life if you don't know how to manage what he gives you. If you don't know how to manage your money, he will make sure you don't get any more. If you don't know how to manage your relationship, he'll make sure that you'll never get married. If you don't know how to manage your children, he'll make sure that you don't have any more. If you don't know how to manage your gifts, he will make sure you'll never have a platform to use them on. Brothers and sisters, God retards harvest when there is no one that is mature enough to know how to manage it. In other words, what I'm saying to you is that if your life is in disorder... In whatever area that may be, whether it is your finances or whether it is your relationship or whether it is your marriage or whether it is your business or whether it is your ministry, wherever there is disorder in your life, God is going to make sure that it does not reign in your life, that you'll never get any blessings. So maybe our prayer request quest needs to be edited. Maybe we need not to pray for more blessings. Maybe God says, why are you praying for something that I'm already wanting to give you? Maybe you need to pray, Lord, help me get my life in order. How many of you would just be honest and say, there are some areas in my life, I just got to get that stuff in order. Come on, people of God. Because if you don't, if you, what if God were to give you what you've been praying for, you ain't ready to receive it yet. Because your life's not in order yet. Some of y'all are praying for a house, and if I were to go back to your apartment right now, you wouldn't let me in. It's so nasty. God says, why would I give you a big house when you can't keep that apartment clean? Some of you are praying for this big career, and you don't never show up to work on time. Some of you are praying for a husband. And you ain't even taking care of the goldfish whale. Some of you praying to be youth pastors, you don't even like your own kids that much. You praying for a new car and your license suspended. Oh, preach, Daryl Arnold. <laughs> Because, because increase is only produced where there is order. God is a God of order. The, the Bible says that there were some people, they were extremely hungry. They had been following Jesus for three days, extremely hungry. And the Bible says that they were fasting, not from a, from a spiritual context. They weren't consecrating. They were following Jesus and found out after about three days that they hadn't had anything to eat. And the Bible says that the disciples came to Jesus and said, these people haven't in, been able to eat. There were 5,000 of them, uh, men, men, not women and children included. More than likely, there was about 25,000 in them. And Jesus said to them, okay, I'm going to work a miracle in their life. I'm going to stretch what they have, and I'm going to feed everybody there, and they're going to have overflow. But here's the caveat. The caveat is, before I feed them, sit them down in 50s and 100s. Make sure first they're seated, and make sure they're seated in order. He says, the moment y'all get in order, I'll start working miracles. That word seated there is talking about rest. First thing you got to understand is there will be no miracles or provision taking, in, taking place in your life till you learn how to calm down and stop tripping. You, you got to rest. Tell somebody, you got to learn how to rest. You're sweating and walking the floor and you're growing gray and your blood pressure is up over something that you cannot change in your own ability. And God says, if you will stop working and start resting, I will stop resting and start working, but I'm not going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing as long as you're stressed out because you cannot have fear and faith at the same time. God says, one of us going to do it. Either you're going to do it or I'm going to do it, and you've been messing it up long enough where you ought to say, Lord, look, if it's going to get done, it's going to be on you. You got to learn how to rest. Rest is the first step of order. Do what he's called you to do, and he'll do what you need him to do in your life. Order is God's strategy for increase. 
My mouth's getting a little dry. Like, to let me, can, you don't, y'all got time for me to get some water here. Come, come here, here pour, pour me some water right there, real quick. All right. So, it, it, tell three people, learn how to rest, baby. Learn how to rest. <laughs> now, they can handle that, but tell the same people, get your life in order. <laughs> All right. Give me a little water here. You, you know why he's not pouring? Oh, okay, okay. I'm not gonna move the. I'm not gonna move the guys. Give me a give me a close up. It's upside down. So although he has what I need, he's got enough wisdom to know that he's not gonna pour out something he got into a life that's upside. <laughs> This is beautiful. You see, see, this water didn't come out the faucet. This is Voss water. Your pastor drank good water. This is Voss water. And this costs too much to waste it on something that does not have the capacity to receive what I'm pouring into. So until you flip your life upside down, God's going to have what you need, but he's going to hold on to it until you get your life in order. Touch somebody and tell them, flip that thing upside down. Flip it upside down. Stop. So maybe I've been praying in vain. I've been praying for God to give me something that I don't even have the capacity to receive let's just lift your hands right now and say Lord put my life in order come on tell them put my credit in order say that come on say, tell, put, see you see you see the only reason you need favor is because your life out of order people who have their life in order don't need favor y'all missed everything I just said you don't need a whole lot of favor when your life is already in order. You don't need God to do a favor for you when you've positioned yourself to get what he wants you to have anyway. And so there's some things that you're going to have to, you're going to have to put in order in order for you to receive the promises of God. Are y'all getting anything yet? <laughs> All right. In this particular story, and I've got to do it really quickly, but in this particular story, and I want y'all to take some notes, we'll shout, we'll shout next week. But in this particular story, th th this, this man, his name is Zacchaeus, he, he, he almost misses the blessing of God. He almost misses the miracles of God because his life is out of order. It's upside down. And I want to show you where his life is upside down. Take me up to this, take me to the to the scriptures. I want to show you something. The, the, the text says, according to verse one, take me into the scriptures really quickly. That Jesus enters into Jericho and he was passing through, meaning that he was not there to stay. That was a very short period of time that he was going to be in that building. He was not going there. To, to plant himself. He was not building a church there. He was going there for some reason, for one reason that was to get to somewhere else. But the Bible says, according to verse 2, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was, a he was a chief tax collector and he was very wealthy. And so when he found out that Jesus was passing through, he interrupted Jesus' plans. Because, because he understands the same thing that we need to understand, and it's this. When Jesus is coming your way, you got to learn how to stop him and get what you need. You see, many of us are going to miss out on miracles because we're waiting on the next opportunity. That's why when the power of the Holy Ghost was falling in this building, you don't have time to be waiting for Easter to tap into it. You don't have time to be waiting for the preacher to give an invitation at the end to be tapped in. This is not the traditional church that says you can only shout in the first 15 minutes or you can only give God praise when the pastor starts humming at the end. No, I love this church because wherever God shows up, you can get in where you fit in. It might be during the announcements. Or it might be during the time where the preacher preacher preaches it may be a, through a song but I'm telling you you can get a miracle in the parking lot if your heart is ready to receive it 
Zacchaeus said, now, wait a minute. He here. There's something I need, and I'm going to grab him. But there's some problems with Zacchaeus' life. It's upside down, and I want to share them with you really quickly, quickly, because the very problems that Zacchaeus has in regards to his life are the very problems that I have and that you have also. Look at the text. Take me up there, right? The Bible says, verse 1, Jesus entered into Jericho, and he was passing through. And a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. His name means pure. Everybody says, say pure. And, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. Thank you so much. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. First thing, I want you to write this down, please. His first problem is his pride in what he had was upside down. The pride of what he had, his possessions, was upside down. The Bible teaches us exactly what his profession was. He was a tax collector. Uh, for those of you that don't know exactly what that, what that, what that is, that, that was not a, 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 a job or a career that was necessarily acceptable. People didn't like tax collectors because the Jews were under Roman government and, and they would use Jews... To take taxes from other Jews and to oppress them and take their money. Now listen to this. Here was the revelation. This was the strategy. If I worked for the Roman government and I was a Jew, they would tell me, go get $10 from each house. This is hypothetical. Go get $10 from each house. Now I could come to your house, Pookie, and say, we want $20 from your house. So although the government only asked me to collect $10, I could ask you for $20, and if you did not give me the $20, I could take your children and bring them into slavery. It was the pimp game. It was the pimp game. And so, and so Zacchaeus, who was a Jew, was taking advantage of his own people. He was working for the man and getting paid. He was flipping it. Why y'all laughing? See, see, y'all need to get delivered. He, 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 was, he was taking something. It was an old, old school dope dealer is what he was. He was taking the dope and selling it to his own people and marking it up so he could get paid. So his money was more important than his own people in his neighborhood. Oh, this is much... And the Bible says he was a chief tax collector, which means he was the best at it. And then the Bible calls him rich. Everybody say rich. Meaning he, was, he had taken advantage of so many people that he became extremely wealthy. Now, here's where I need you to get. Look at verse 2. Take me up there. Verse 2 says, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. He had position. He had popularity. He had privileges. He had prosperity. He had all the money he wanted. He had all the power he needed. He bought whatever he wanted. But look at the next verse. And he wanted to see who Jesus was. Oh, this is a good word here. You know why this is a good word here? Because it teaches us something, that you can have all the money you ever dreamed of. You could drive a Benz, a Bentley, and a Bugatti. You can have a Burberry pocketbook. You can have Versace or Louis. You can be the married to the finest man and the most gorgeous woman. You can have degrees on all of your walls. You can have a tailor-made outfit on. You can have the best weave that they sell, the Brazilian kind. But here's the reality. God has has placed a hole inside of you that nothing will fit but him. I can't get nobody to help me here. I can't get, I need about six of y'all that'll be honest and say, you know what? That was a void in me and I tried to fill it with everything. I slept with every woman that I could think of, but I still didn't feel like I was loved. I gave sex up, but I didn't feel sexy after I got finished. I bought a car, but I still felt like I was going nowhere. I got a house, but I can't sleep at night. I smoked weed, I shot up, I got high, but I came down and I had to go back up again. But when I met Jesus... <laughs> he picked me up, turned me around, set my feet on solid ground. Anybody know Jesus? <laughs> you see, 
we stop this? Stop this. When I met Jesus, he filled the void that was inside of me. So I might still be on the bus stop, but I can still sing soon and very soon. We are going to see the king because the bus don't stop me. I got Christ in me, the hope of glory. Yeah, I went through a whole nother Valentine's Day by myself. I had to take myself to dinner, had to buy myself flowers, but it reminded me that Jesus will never leave me. He will never forsake me, but he will be with me until the ends of the earth. Anybody can sing the old song, long as I got King Jesus. He, he, he created us, family, with this divine vacuum. This is too much. This is Theology 101. He created us with what, what, what theologians call, what biblicists call, a divine vacuum. And so the, 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 the word picture in which God is trying to teach us through this divine vacuum is that when God created you, he put you together like a puzzle. Like a puzzle. And he put you together, and he put all the pieces together, but the middle piece, the center piece, he took it out and put it in his pocket. The center, P-I-E-C-E. -E. He took it out, and he put it in his pocket. And all of your life, you've been trying to get the center filled. And you, you, you tried to fill it with cognac and gin, and you tried to fill it, you tried to fill it with Grand Marnier, and you tried to fill it, y'all, I'm going to hit yours in a minute, with, uh, with grape juice and cranberry juice. You tried, to, you tried to fill it with Old English 800. You, you tried to fill it with a black and mild. You tried to fill it with a blunt. You tried to fill it with Rudy and Tim and Thomas, and you tried to fill it with Tamika and Juanita. You tried to fill it with degrees. You tried to fill it with outfits. You tried to fill it with pocketbooks. You tried to fill it with houses. You tried to fill it with swimming pools you tried to fill it with pride and popularity but but that one p-i-e-c-e -E was in the pocket of god and god said you always gonna feel empty and incomplete until you get that p-i-e-c-e -E in me and when i give it to you i'll turn your p-i-e-c-e -E into p-e-a he'll give you peace that's a past is all understanding Bump somebody and tell them nobody but Jesus. So you can sit there and look all wonderful and terrific if you want to. You can sit there with your legs, Christ. You know there was a day they was wide open. But I'm going to give God praise because he gave me his peace. That's your boy. His life was upside down. It was upside down. His life was upside down because he had pride in what he had. But not only did he have pride in what he had, his life was upside down because of the people he was hanging with. Take me up there, verse 3. Oh, good, I'm doing great on time. Verse 3, come on, come on, come on. He wanted to see Jesus. He had everything in the natural that anybody else would want to have, but he wants to see Jesus. He wanted to see who Jesus was. This is where you ought to shout. I shouted when I saw this because he didn't want to see what Jesus had. He wanted to see who Jesus was. 75% of the people that walked in these doors today, you walked in because you wanted to see what Jesus had, what he could offer you, what he can give you. But this man ain't even saved. And he don't want nothing from Jesus. He just want to know 
Oh, yes. But because he was short, for we all have sinned and fallen (laughs) short of the kingdom of God. Because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. What, what, what the text is trying to teach us from a, from a spiritual perspective, from a third dimensional perspective, from an a, a application perspective, is there's certain people that will never see Jesus because of the crowd. It's not that he's not there. It's not that they don't want to believe him. It's not that they won't trust him. It's not that they don't want to give their life to him. But there are certain people would see Jesus and receive Jesus, but, but, pe- but because of people who say they connected to Jesus but don't act like it, the crowd is blocking who he really is. Well, what if more people would be in this place today if it wasn't for how you live? What if your Facebook posts are keeping people from seeing Jesus? What if your secret sin, the ones not that you do here, but that you do the day before Sunday, keeps people from seeing Jesus? He, the crowd is supposed, listen to this family, It's supposed to lift you up and point you towards Jesus. It's not to pull you down so you can't see him. You need to hang with people that help you see Jesus better. Oh, this is much. Y'all want me to tell you to high five your neighbor. If you want to, okay, high five your neighbor and tell them you got to get with a crowd that helps you see Jesus. If, you, if you're hanging with people that don't help you see Jesus, you need to find another crowd. My time is, is almost gone. He, 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 the people that he was hanging with were upside down. Mm-hmm. But the people who he was hanging with were upside down. But not only that, according to the first point, his pride in what he had was upside down. But, but then let, let me hit this last one, maybe the last one. His perception of divine hierarchy was upside down. Th- this is going to be difficult to teach because you're an American. Verse 4. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Give me the next verse. When Jesus reached the spot, this is it, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, come down. He he did not understand biblical hierarchy. I want you to get the illustration here. Listen, Listen to this boom. This dude says, I'm going to see Jesus. I just don't want Jesus to see me seeing him. I, I, I'm going to look at Jesus. I just don't want Jesus to look at me. I want to praise him in secret. I, I want to be a closet Christian. Touch somebody and tell them everything else come out of the closet. Come on out with them. Boom. Look, look, look at the illustration. Jesus reached the spot. He says to Zacchaeus, Jesus looks up and said to Zacchaeus, come down. Everybody say, Jesus looked up. Jesus. Told Zacchaeus, come down. Jesus looked up. Jesus looked up. Told Zacchaeus, come down. Look at the illustration. The sinner is looking down at the Savior. And the Savior 
is looking up at the center. Touch somebody and tell them something is wrong with that picture. So now you don't have the center at the feet of God. This is good word. I'm telling you it is. You don't have the center at the feet of God. You got God at the foot of a center? And that has become the American church. Where, where we think that we can tell God what we going to do. Ain't nobody going to say amen. I don't care nothing about y'all. I ain't scared of y'all. I am not scared of y'all. You, you, we think we can tell God we're going to come when we want to. We're going to pray when we want to. We're going to fast if we want to. We're going to love you when we want to. We're going to do what we want to that we like in the Bible. And the stuff we don't like in the Bible, we're going to say that didn't come from God. The devil is a liar. If you're going to be blessed, you're going to have to get your nasty behind on the ground and say, God, whatever you say, it's right. The Savior got to look down at the sinner. The sinner can't look down at the Savior. Who do you think that you are? Who do you think that you are? Well, you can tell God what you're going to do. You don't let your kids do that. Who do you think you are? I don't feel like going to church. Who asks you how you feel? Ain't nobody ask you how you feel. I can't go to church. I got this job. God said, I know how to fix that. I ain't fix that. Let me holler at your boss. <laughs> Let me holler at your boss. I'll make sure you got plenty of time. I don't like standing up at church, Okay. Let me let that sugar diabetes hit your feet and cut them feet off. I bet you'll want to stand up then. Jesus said, you want a miracle? Come down. I'm not going to bless you up there. You're too high for yourself. So I'll bring you down. So you'll know who really in charge. <laughs> Anybody here ever, God had to slap you down so you could look up? I can't get nobody to help me. I, I, can't, I can't get nobody to tell the truth. Okay, I'm the only person that's got a spiritual black eye and God put him in a Holy Ghost headlock. And Come on. A am I the only person God just kept beating me till I tapped out and said, okay, God, you got me. I'm cool. I'm, whatever you want to do, I'm good with Oh, God won't do that. He loves us. <laughs> if God spared not his own son, if he let his son go to hell for something he didn't do but for something we did, oh, you think he loved you so much that he's not going to punish you for you trying to be him? Bump somebody and tell him you got God twisted. Am I getting on y'all no nerves yet? Give me a little time. I'm working on it. Now, now this, being old, is, is my favorite part. Y'all taking notes? The, the, the first point was his pride in what he had was upside down. Everybody say his pride and what he had was upside down. Now say, my stuff don't make me. Say, I'm bigger than my bank account. I got more Jesus in me than my credit report. Tell him I look good on the outside, but I'm better on the inside. No, number two, yes, ma'am. Oh, you, you so in my word. You so in my word. That's my next point, girl. Second point, the people he was hanging with was upside down. You tell somebody, you got to start hanging with the right people. Third, third point is this. Are you, ready? you ready for this, Sister Joyce? And I ain't typing, trying to put it in to fit it. Right? Look at what it said. Number three, 
his perception <laughs> of divine hierarchy was upside down. He understood, he needed to understand that God is in control and the sinner can't look down at the Savior. Here's the fourth one, and this is how we're closing. His process to go to heaven was upside down. Take this, man. Take this. His process to go to heaven was upside down. Now, now this, you got to engage in your mind. If you allow your mind to engage, I promise you're going to tear this church up. Uh, look at your neighbor and ask him, is your weave track in tight? No, look at him tell him, no, for real though, for real though, because cause if not, you probably want to go to the bathroom and tighten it up a little bit, because what I'm about to say. Look. Listen to me. He says, Zacchaeus, he looked up, the Savior looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down for today. Day. I must, I love that word, abide in your house, not your church. He didn't say I'm coming to your church. He said I'm coming to your house. A anybody, anybody want Jesus to hang out at your house? I ain't talking about your church. I, I, <laughs> that old car might crank if Jesus get in your house. That that dude might stop slapping you if Jesus come to your house. Them grades might come up on that kid's report card if Jesus get in your house. She said, now, if you want me at your house, you got to come down. Where is that kid's right now? Talk to me, y'all. Where? He's where? Where is the Savior right now? So, so Zacchaeus, the sinner, is where? He's where? He's in a tree. The Savior, this good, is on the ground. Zacchaeus is in a tree. The sinner is in a tree. The Savior is on the ground. The sinner is in a tree. The Savior's on the ground. The sinner is in a tree. The Savior's on the ground. Here it is. The sinner is hanging on a tree. And the Savior's on the ground. Jesus said, boy, you trying to mess up my plan. He said, the sinner can't be hanging on a tree. And looking down at the Savior, he said, come down, because in a few more chapters, <laughs> I'm going to be hanging on a tree. They hung him high. Ooh, they stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. How about somebody tell him, that's love. But that's not how the story ends. Y'all supposed to shout right there. The third day morning, he high five somebody, tell them that's love. He said, well, I don't care how much money you got. I don't care what you the chief of. You can't redeem yourself. Okay, how many degrees you got? Okay, how many times I ride past your picture on a billboard? You don't impress me. You better get off that tree. Because cursed is any man that hangeth upon a tree. So you come down. Let me go up. And we can go home. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. He said, if you come down off the tree, let me go up on the tree and we can go home. 
Let me say it one more time, because y'all think I'm talking about somebody's address. If you come off the tree center, let me get on the tree, then we can walk to heaven and go home together. I need everybody in here to give God the loudest praise you got, because you didn't have to hang on a tree. He came down. We came down. He went up so we could go home together. This good week. Say that with me. We came down so he could go up. Now we going home together. Put your hands together and give God praise today. That ain't good enough. I said that ain't good enough. That show sure enough ain't good enough. I want you to praise God until he turns your life from upside down to right side up. Everyone stand. I got happy off this myself. I was studying it. And start getting happy. Because there are yet still days, y'all. I try to redeem myself. Oh, you too. There, there are still days, Tammy, that I, I try to fix myself. It's innate, it's natural. And, and I try to fix it. And, and I'm and I'm and I'm convicted because I tell y'all. Let God fix it. Then when I get in the jam, I start bringing my toolbox out. Don't look at me like that. You do the same thing. And God says, come down, man. And I'll go up. We can go home together. I'll fix it. If you would just get your life in order. You know what happened next? This this is about for the for, for the few people that left early. I pray this wasn't their word, because this this is the word that I need for y'all to hear, family. You know what Zacchaeus said? Okay, you gonna go home with me? Okay. I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do then. If, if you'll come to my house. I give half of everything I got to the poor. And, and everything I stole, I repay it four times. I preached this wrong so many years. Guess what? That statement was upside down. Because what he's saying is, I got to fix everything I messed up before I got saved. And, and God said, I never, Jesus never asked a man to do that. He's, what Jesus was saying is, let's start fresh today. Ooh, this good. <laughs> Tiffany, this good, that's good. He said, I ain't ask you to fix the stuff that you messed up. Let's start fresh today. Some of you can't do good things going forward because you still stuck with trying to do good stuff that you messed up years ago. You got to get to the place where you say, y'all, I know I messed up. I, I know I took the money. I know, mama, I know I, I, I hurt you. I, I get it. I know I embarrassed you. I know I went to jail. I know I got a record. I, I know, Lord, I know God, I know y'all I messed up, but I, I can't fix yesterday. But can I start a new today? I, I promise I'm going to try to do better on Monday but I can't fix Saturday because I just had a Sunday morning experience and I can't go backwards but I got his hand now and we go forwards together let God handle your past and you handle your future you ain't gotta fix it you can't you didn't have Jesus you acted a fool because you was one 
You acted ignorant. That's Chattanooga word. Ignorant. Because you were ignorant. You didn't know no better. You acted like you ain't know God. Because you didn't have God. So everybody in here, look this way. And wave goodbye at your yesterday. Hit reset today. And blow a kiss at tomorrow. <laughs> Put your hands together and give God praise. I'm through. Is it Lord make me own? That's what I'm here to say. Lift your hands and let's thank God. We're almost finished. Come on, come on. Let's thank him. Let's thank him. Everyone sing that. Let that be your confession. Lord. Come on, we can't watch them worship. Let's let that be our confession. Lord. Over. Make me over again. Come on, sing that as loud as you can, Lord. Make me over again. I need to hear everybody sing that. Come on, Lord. Yes, God, Lord. It doesn't matter what you've done last year or last month or last week or even last night. Today, He'll make you over. He'll make Sing that as loud as you can. Make me over again. Stay right there. Stay right there. Stay right there. Come on, sing it again. Make me over again. Just the voices. Make me over again. Make me over again. Lord, make me over. his hand all over the building as a matter of fact as a matter of fact preachers this time y'all just come all the way up preachers y'all just come all the way up I just sense this is a word that we need to stay connected as a matter of fact I want you to cross the aisles and grab somebody's hand let them know you're not in this thing by yourself make me over right there make me over again Stay there, quiet. Bring it down. Make me over again. My brothers and sisters, this is your moment. We're believing God for 300 souls in the kingdom of God. Starting today, 37 of them have already given their lives to Jesus. Would you be in this number? Would you be in this number? Today, God is calling you to come down off of your tree of dependency, self-dependency. Come down off of your tree of not trusting anybody, including God. Come down off of your tree of low self-esteem. Come down off of your tree of pride and arrogance. I'm going to do this by myself. He says, if you'll come down off of the tree, I'll come up and get on the tree and we can go home together. So quit trying to fix something you don't have the tools to fix. Give it to Jesus. And God will give it to you. Every head bowed, every eye is closed. My brothers and sisters, I offer Christ to you today. Again, I don't care what you've done last week. You can done, you could have done what the world calls the nastiest thing. But God doesn't weigh our sins. He doesn't have a sin scale. If you've ever sinned one time in your life, whether it's a little white lie, whatever the heck that is, or a big black lie, whatever, that is God sees them all the same one sin will send you to hell but one Christ will give you the ability to go to heaven so take this moment out right now and I want you to do an internal investigation of your own heart and ask yourself God have I given you my life completely and if I haven't let me take advantage of this moment three different types of people are in this building number one people who have never ex received or accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation before I want you to give your life to Jesus. Doesn't matter where, where you are in life, God will save you today. He'll save you like you are. He just won't let you stay how you are. Second group of people, you're saying, hey, Pastor, look, I'm saved, but I'm without a church home. I need one. And I believe that this is the place where I'm supposed to be. 
today is the day that God wants you to connect. Third group of people, you say, hey, Pastor, look, I'm saying I have a church home, but it's in another city, and I'm going to be here for a little while, and I want to come under watch care. I want you to take care of me, man. Pray for me. I want to get this word until I go back. I'm not leaving my church in Chicago or Memphis or Detroit, but I need to be covered into them, and I'm going to talk to my pastor and let him know, hey, I'm still, I'm still a, a member of your church. I'm just going to be here for a couple of years, and I don't think you want me to be uncovered. I need a word till I get back. You're in those three categories. When I count to three, I just want you to squeeze somebody's hand. First group of people, you want to get saved. The second group of people, you're connecting to this ministry. Third group of people, you're coming under watch care. When I count to three, I want you to respond by squeezing somebody's hands as though you were squeezing the hands of Jesus Christ today. For those of you that don't know Jesus, as you begin to squeeze somebody's hand, I want you to see yourself coming off of that tree. And him going up on the tree dying for your sins. One, don't let the enemy keep you down another day of your life. When I count to three, I want you to squeeze that hand if I'm talking to you in any of those three categories. Two, pride come up before destruction and a halt your heart before a good fall. Don't allow your pride to keep you from the Prince of Peace. One, two, three, if I'm talking to you, squeeze that hand right now all over the building. Squeeze it tight. You'd be ashamed of me in the presence of your brethren. Then shall I be ashamed of you in the presence of my Father, which is in heaven. You can't be ashamed of Jesus and serve him at the same time. If you didn't squeeze somebody's hand, I'm going to give you one more time. One, two, three. Squeeze it right now as tight as you can. Don't you wait till Easter. Easter may never come. If somebody squeezed your hand, I want you to lift that hand as high as you can. I see you, my brother. See you, my sister. See you, my sister. See you, my brother. See you, my sister. See you, my sister. See you, my brother. See you, my brother. See you, my sister. All right, everybody that has a hand up, everybody that has a hand up, if somebody squeezed your hand or lifted their hand, you lifted your hand, bring them to the altar. I just want to pray for them. Don't let them come by themselves. Y'all ought to be thanking God because decisions have been made for Jesus. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Will you look at this harvest? I said, will you look at this harvest? Woo! We might hit our 300 before resurrection. Look at this harvest. Come on. They're still coming. Take me over again. If you know you need to be down here and you haven't moved yet, Take me over <laughs> in the words of Donald Trump, what else do you have to lose? <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. They're still coming. Young people are coming, y'all. Y'all ought to thank God. I just married a young man day before yesterday. Come on, thank God for this young people that are making decisions for Jesus. Woo! Trying to see if y'all gonna clap without me telling you to. Those of you that are at the altar, would you just lift your hands straight up in the air? There are hundreds of people that are stretching their hands towards you, praying for you, and you're not even in ICU. Isn't that something? You've got hundreds and hundreds of people praying for you, and your child doesn't even have cancer. Isn't that something? You got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people praying for you, and you're not even getting cut out of a vehicle on I-40. Isn't that something? That, that, that people are praying for you, hundreds of people are praying for you, and you're not looking at 10 to 15 years in prison next week. You got people praying for you that you will walk with Jesus. Everybody pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this word. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me, and he got up 
so that I could live the victorious life. Today, I'm coming out my tree. I'm coming down out of this tree so he can climb up and die on the tree for me. I believe by faith that Jesus Christ died for my sin. And early the third day morning, he got up with all power in his hand. I'm saved. I'm saved and I'm safe. Jesus, come to my house. I believe it by faith. In Jesus' name, give him praise all over this building. Woo! Come on, choir. Praise with me. I sang with y'all. <laughs> make me over again. Make me over. So what's taking place is they're handing you cards. We're going to call you. As a matter of fact, some of you, I'm personally going to call you just to pray with you, just to let you know that I love you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We'll be here seven more minutes. As you sit down, prepare. We're about to prepare our gifts, and we're going to give into the kingdom of God. It is giving time at OBC. God just gave to us. Let's give back to him. The best thing you can do right now is turn your financial life right side up. So everybody prepare your gifts. I'm not going to push you on that. Everybody knows what you should do here. Everybody give your tithe. Your tithe is a tenth of everything that the Lord has given you. For those of you that say, if you would like me, this is how I was in church growing up. At giving time, I ain't had no money, so I slipped out right then. I was like, man, I'm going to get out of here because I ain't got no money. You don't have to do that here because even if you don't have any money, somebody's going to put some money in your hand. Isn't that beautiful? We're just that type of family. And so uh, you don't have to slip out. Get in. Slip in. Don't slip out. Slip in and allow the Lord to put uh, uh, bring forth a harvest in your life. All right, so we're going to do two things, and we're going to do it really, really quickly. Number one, we're about to prepare our tithes and our offerings. A tithe is a tenth of everything that the Lord is giving you. Your offering is that seed that you put in the ground to produce a harvest and your first fruit. When you want God to increase you or you have, you have been increased, the Bible says, I have the ability as your pastor to command a financial blessing to rest upon your house. So if you're giving a first fruit from increase, maybe it was an income tax uh, uh, check, or maybe it was a bonus, or maybe it was a raise, or maybe somebody just put some money in your hand and blessed you, and you want to sow a little portion of that back into the kingdom of God, I want you to get a green envelope. Everybody say a green envelope. I want you to get a green envelope and put that in a green envelope. And that I don't want you to put in this basket. I want to personally pray for you. I want to personally pray for you. And so we're going to ask that uh, you, uh, during communion, would just come and bring it to me so I can personally pray for you. If you need a first fruit envelope, envelope lift your hand. If you need a first fruit envelope, Lift your hand, lift your hand, all right? So the ushers are taking care of you. If you need any envelope at all, lift your hand, amen? The ushers will take care of you. You can give here several different ways. You can give through smart giving. That's the way I give. Or you can give electronically through uh, Minister Dan, uh, Minister um, Tiffany, who was to my right. Uh, she, she'll swipe your car. It is, it is uh, safe and secure. Uh, we have made sure of of that you can give through cash you can give through check but everybody wants you to give if you don't have anything to give wave at me wave at me if you don't have anything to give keep them keep waving keep waving if you see a hand that is waving and you're close to them would you put a seed in their hand really quickly that's what we do here we love each other when we was in the world and we was trying to do some crazy stuff what did you say i got five on it how y'all see y'all need to get saved So if you was going to put five on the keg, you at least put ten in somebody's hand. Amen. Touch somebody and tell them spiritual inflation. Yeah. All right. So you're going to give five to the world. You ought to at least put ten in the king, to the kingdom. So I want you to give the best gift that you have today, uh, and, and God is going to work a miracle in your life. All right. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Pop, it is on you. All right. Uh, we're about to have communion, and this is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to take up our offering and have communion at the same time, all right?